Your ears do not deceive you. You have just entered the Cryptid Creator Corner brought to you by your friends at Comic Book Yeti. So without further ado, let's get on to the interview. <laughs> yes, I can clearly see that I rolled a one. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. While the Yeti determines my fate, I wanted to tell you about our friends at Sanity Damage. They are an amazing D&D actual play live show. The campaign features a high seas adventure full of piracy, steampunk, and Lovecraftian horror elements. You can find Sanity Damage on any podcasting platform or watch the party live on YouTube. Catch them bi-weeklies on Thursdays at 7.30 Eastern Time on YouTube at The Homebrew d and I'll throw it in the show notes to make it easy. Oh, and never let a Yeti be the DM. This is Byron O'Neill, your host for today's episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner. We're about to hit get hit by one of a heck of a storm here in North Carolina today. So if the gods are kind, my power won't die. But fingers crossed, it's my pleasure to to host two comics writers on the show today, um, among other things that they have done. Uh, so I'm welcoming Bar- Mark Verheiden and Aaron Douglas to chat about their new supernatural thriller miniseries, Borealis from Dark Horse Comics. Mark and Aaron, thanks for joining me today. How's it? It is. You guys are getting hit with a storm. I'm looking out my window right now, and the trees are sideways. So, yikes. East Coast, West Coast, we're all getting punched in the face. Uh, a lot of bright, sunny. 40 degrees, but bright hey, sunny. Why don't you just sit there quietly there, Verheiden? <laughs> no one wants your sunshine. LA monsters. I gotta go. Well, I really enjoyed uh, the, the, I've got a chance to read the first two issues um, and, and really enjoyed them, especially kind of the native generational conflict. Uh, we just don't see that represented that much in the comics medium that much. So, so that was kind of refreshing. I was drawn to this project initially for several reasons. Um, there's kind of the promise of supernatural shenanigans, but additionally, we are set in rural Alaska, and its focus is following a native state trooper uh, named Sillaluk. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Is that close enough? All right. Okay. As she is drawn back home after an extended absence and must face her past and contend with her own destiny, which is intertwined with her family's uh, shamanic roots. So let's kind of scroll back to the beginning. I have two co writers who presumably know each other, at least going back as far as the Battlestar Galactica days. So, how did this kick off? What do you think, Marin? Uh, over about cocktails and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I've go, always go, wanted... yeah. Go ahead, Mark. In Vegas. Well, I'd go a little further back. That we we uh, we got to know each other. You know, I knew, of course, knew Aaron on Battlestar, but we really got to know each other on a show called Hemlock Grove. Okay. And um, started uh, chatting a lot about stuff we wanted to do, and and we learned we also like to have martinis and go to Vegas. So. <laughs> While there, we uh, were talking, and Aaron uh, and I share a love of the, the show Deadwood. Uh, we both think it's a fantastic show. And um, Aaron uh, had this idea, which he can tell you about, uh, and uh, it really sparked something with me. Now, it unfortunately took me about a year or two to <laughs> have it spark around, but uh, it, it's a great idea, and we just sort of let that evolve into what became Borealis. Okay. Yeah, I, like Mark says, uh, Deadwood. Dead, for me, Deadwood's the best TV show ever made, and I love it. Is great. It's great. Yeah, it's like modern day Shakespeare, and and I really like the the isolation of it. And being from Canada, um, you know, everything's sort of isolated. We're all isolated up here. No matter where you live, you're kind of uh, you could you could start driving, and then you get those signs that say you know 172 kilometers to the next gas station. So make sure you. Happens in some places in America, but really a lot here in Canada. Um, and I really like the idea of something isolated and really cut off and like Deadwood. But, uh, and I like the idea of the, the dry town, the dry county where everything is underground and everything is black market. And so I said, let's just put it somewhere where they get a shipment once a year. Like there's literally one boat comes in once a year and brings all the supplies to the town for the year. And then they just have to ration it out or fly it in or truck it in. But for a lot of the year, the ground isn't frozen enough to drive across. And for the rest of the year, it's, uh, it's, too, it's muddy. So it either has to be completely dry or completely frozen for trucks to get there. So they're really, really cut off. And in the bad Bad weather, you can't even fly in. So these people are just, they're literally on an island 
attached to the land, which is an interesting thing in and of itself. But I pitched that to Mark, and Mark said, "Ooh, that sounds really cool." And then the uh, the for me, it was just a straight good guys, bad guys, um, with the nuance of uh, gray hats. Sort of the Al Swear engines is well, this is a really bad guy, and then somebody even worse shows up. You go, ah, I mean, you know what? Al's not so bad. And uh, and then Mark Mark is uh, completely to blame for the fabulous supernatural stuff. He wanted to twist and uh, bring that piece of it to to it to the story, and, it, and it's just made it so much better. And I'll be eternally grateful for that. So yeah, it was Vegas Martinis writing on a napkin, and then a bunch of years went by, and he said, "What did you ever do with that thing?" And I said, "You know what? I I've been waiting for you." And he said, "Okay, well, let's do it." And that's really the the genesis of it all. I think what, right. what struck me was the horror of a dry town. I mean, <laughs> for God's sake. Um, but but I did. I really loved. I really, aside from the supernatural, which which came later, I loved the idea of this gangster element, which is sort of hard to. I mean, obviously there's drugs and stuff now and everywhere, but the idea of sort of prohibition era rum runners, you know, taking yeah. uh, booze up to this town. Uh, and by the way, Aaron, you know, uh, maybe you've seen this show, but there's this new show about uh, shipments of uh, stuff going to these incredibly remote towns in uh, Canada, uh, up by the Arctic Circle, and is set on the boat, set on the ships, and how they have to crack through ice and stuff. And it is once a year. And if these towns don't get their shipments, man, they they uh, they're in big big trouble. Um, but aside from that, uh, it gives you an idea of what. Kind of the town could look like. Some of these places are just, they do drone shots of them. They're like, you know, 40 houses on the edge of a, of a, you know, an endless nothing. And I think, you know, we made kind of a little bigger than that. I think like a town of about 2000, but because we wanted just more interpersonal stuff going on. But uh, that was the sort of town I had in mind when we started talking about uh, Borealis and where, where it could be set. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Martinis, Alaska, got that connection. <laughs> that makes so much sense. Um, I wanted to focus on Alaska kind of as, uh, as that narrative element, because uh, I think it's so essential to everything you're trying to do. You know, and I, I get exactly what you're talking about, Aaron. I spent some time, we lived in the Pacific Northwest for seven years. So I, I get that like outside your door and all of a sudden you have space, right? Yeah. It's just it's very different than, than the Eastern part of, of, of the U.S. or even Canada to some extent. Um, back in my landscape photographer days, I spent uh, quite a bit of time there outside, so I'm familiar with it. You know, the that remoteness, that isolation that you guys are speaking to. I mean, Aaron, Google tells me you spent some formative time in like Creston, British Columbia yeah. growing up, which is yeah. what close to the Idaho border, which is pretty far out in its own right, right? Um, yeah, so I'm curious, you know, Alaska is always associated with survival themes and and touched on that. You know, there is the Okay, these folks may they may not get their Starbucks. I mean, that's uh, but this is kind of survival of a different sort. So it has that an oddly urban feel to it. So how did how did you kind of go about infusing that in the story? Um, well, for me, the 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 town itself, if if it was just a town. Uh, that would be one thing, but the fact that it serves uh, an oil and gas company, mm -hmm. and so you've got all the rig guys that are coming from disparate parts of the world, and so they're bringing that element to the town whenever they're in town, and they've got more money than God and nothing to do with it except for spend it. Right. And so it, like, if again, if it was just the town, it would just be this little town that nobody ever thought about, and they, you know, they they send a ship up there every once in a while, once a year. Uh, but these guys that fly in and and they just bring their culture, their everything. So it becomes this sort of mini metropolis uh, that is representative of um, all kinds of cultures and, and uh, very strange and worldly things. And it's a place to hide for some of these bad guys, too. They're getting away from whoever's trying to find them for whatever reason. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the title itself kind of holds a certain mysticism to it when you talk about Borealis or the Aurora Lights, which I know it's hard to explain kind of the mix of emotions I've personally felt standing under them. It was like all in a universal connection, but a very creepy one. Um, mm -hmm. it, but maybe that's my formative years talking because there's always this association with the H.P. Lovecraft um, story 
uh, that's associated with the, the aurora and an alien stuck in a in a meteorite. Have either of you seen them or um, experienced oh, yeah. it? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I live in Vancouver, and on a really really clear night when the boreal aurora borealis is going nuts, you can see it from here, um, which is insane to think because we are so far away. Uh, but then also I've been up north far enough to uh, to see them as well. They are it's it's unreal it's a whole you haven't experienced it and like seeing it in pictures and in movies and stuff it's, it's really interesting but the sound and the feel and the crackle is something extraordinary otherworldly really yeah yeah for sure well our main protagonist Siluk, has some familial connection to them you know i have a degree in anthropology with a focus on native american mythology so it, it looks like you are referencing the inuit people or at least vaguely um in the story mm-hmm Okay. In, indigenous cultures up there. Um, we, we, you know, we wanted to investigate what it's like to be uh, in that world. Although Syl is, we call her Syl. Okay. She's between those two worlds because um, she was, uh, you know, has an Inuit mother or uh, an Inuit mother, but a uh, uh, indigenous mother and a uh, white father. So a father who she's never met. So uh, you know, she's she finds herself sort of in this cultural. Ism, I think, between uh, you know who she really is, and you know she left she left Kainu because uh, whatever that town was doing to her, because of her indigenous sort of identification, was was not working for her. So she she was saved, rescued, basically, and uh, that was that was the idea to play with, um, uh, and also a clash of cultures in Kainu itself, because obviously you have uh, you have sort of a white law enforcement agency there and uh you've got uh again a vast indigenous population you've got these roughnecks coming in uh, part-time from oil rigs um oh we didn't get into that that much in this in this series we will in future series and then of course you have the gangsters you have some really bad guys so uh and uh so it's sort of you know i when i when i worked in writer writers rooms and this is getting a little afield but i always had this term called keeping balls in the air and uh, what, what I loved about Aaron's idea when we started was there were a lot of balls in the air. There were all sorts of crisscrossing stories we could play with. Um, and then we added the supernatural aspect, which yet another sort of ball in the air. Um, mm-hmm. And as we delved into it and started breaking down the story, I think we developed even more of those cross currents of stories and stuff. Uh, you know, not just dealing with the indigenous population, but with what it's like, the survivalist aspect of living in a town like that. Um, and um, and sort of the, uh, the sort of, I don't know, almost grueling nature of being under those conditions, the weather conditions, how that just can wear a person down, um, playing with that too. Yeah, I mean, she was a very broken character in many ways. And, you know, more than anything else from the two issues I've read, it's about kind of confronting your past um, kind of before you can take that next step towards who you ultimately are, are meant to be. Um, so kind of what was was appealing about pinning her as a character in in that way in terms of growth? It was for me, it was the the reluctance to to face the past. Like she had shut that door. She never wanted to go back into that room and then she gets sent back there. And like you say, it's that you have to deal with something before you can move on to the next thing. and and uh, she certainly absolutely does not want to. But as the series will go along, she will deal with it, and then she'll find out all kinds of things about herself that she did not know. Uh, people around her knew, but haven't shared with her. Like old mother has the whole story of her backstory, but uh, and the ancestors in the past and the supernatural component. But still, feels things welling up inside her, but she doesn't know what they are. Uh, and as those get revealed, then she sort of has the opportunity to deal with the past, but also look forward to the future and embrace or put aside these things that she doesn't understand. And that makes it, uh, it makes it for me, it makes it compelling how, how, and what is she going to do? Yeah. I mean, she's gone through so much trauma. I feel like we should kind of throw in a trigger warning for future readers about the kind of the sexual assault element, but she's also facing, you know, the death of a family member and being imperiled by, you know, this bunch of local goons that are running illegal stuff. That's a lot, man. I mean, that's that's a lot for the for her as a character to to kind of absorb and and to go through. Um, 
and you also have her name associated with polar bear spirit. Uh, the Inuit people have a strong connection to animism as well. You know, and I know you can't spell it out exactly because it's giving it away, but will we, will that continue to maintain a relevance here if only roughly? Um, Cause there's, there's like the reference to the the shadow people and I'm not going to even try to pronounce that because I'll completely butcher <laughs> it. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 I think we're going to, con- we're definitely going to continue that. We're going to explore that much further um, as we go into uh, future series. Um, uh, we, we touch on it, uh, as you'll see at the end of issue three, we touch on it, but, um, we, uh, we're definitely teasing out that story because it's the same for her. She's, she's slowly realizing what her past was about and, uh, coming to terms with what she was. I mean, you know, we re- I really like the idea of how damaged she is when we meet her at the beginning where, uh, she's, you know, she's undercover. She's a police officer. Well, okay. We get that. But she actually like takes drugs. Which, yeah. by the way, if you're undercover, you're just not supposed to do that. You're supposed to avoid <laughs> that if you can possibly do that, avoid it. And um, and then does something incredibly reckless, you know, to stop the bad guy. So clearly she's uh, uh, reckless with her own life. And so where did that come from? And that's sort of what the first series, I think, explores. Where did, where did that darkness come from in her? And it's not just emotional darkness, but it's also a darkness that's been planted in her which we'll discover as we go further along where that actually comes from and what that is more. Uh, we, we, we know, uh, but we're, uh, we're teasing it out, I think, for future, uh, future discussions of the, the series. Yeah, I like the idea of her finding it as the reader finds it. So you're, the reader and, the, and Syl are sort of discovering, discovering all of those elements at the same time, and then they along with her, have to decide, well, what does this mean? What is the meaning of this? How, does, how do we deal with this? What do I think about it? All that kind of stuff. All right, let's take a quick break. What in the Sam Hill is happening right now? What is that? Yeah, what you know? You like bards? Yeah, what you know? Oh, you like band of bards. It's not my fault, you mumble. Yeah, what you know? That makes sense. They're dropping some great new series right now. There's that one about a heavy metal guitarist in the 1970s with monsters, working class wizards. You know how we love monsters around here. And my friend Dakota Brown, he's working on a project, uh, Grandma Tilly's Hell Tech Mech with Lane Lloyd. I saw the preview for that. That is crazy. Jimmy even contributed to their anthology from the static and had Matt Sumo on the podcast to talk about his project, The Bardic Verses, which makes a lot of sense that the project landed there. Where can you find them? You need to get out more. They are in previews, or you can visit their website, bandabars.com, for all the latest. Can we turn the music off now? Thank you. No more surprises. Minstrels or anything like that, or I'll rent you out to the Ren Fair as a children's ride. Let's get back to the show. First, I want to take a moment to actually thank you guys for, for tackling um, the substance abuse in in native communities i know that's a really sensitive you know kind of issue you know i was on the board of a rehab center we lived in washington um and i found the portrayal of addiction in this to kind of be refreshing you know especially addressing fentanyl um which you don't see a lot of media do so it's not shying away from it it's 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 a direct approach so you know thank you um what what made you want to kind of include that as an element because it, it's a very very strong pull for the character well for me uh if you're gonna tell a story about something you got to be authentic you got to do it right i learned that on battlestar we had uh retired master sergeant ron blacker u.s rangers army rangers as our uh, tech advisor and he ran us through a boot camp for three days before we started filming and he would show up and he would tell us how to dress, wear your uniform like that, don't wear it like this, you don't need that, nobody would ever do that. Taught us how to salute and march and everything to be authentic because you know, any military person watches a military show and just goes, oh, come on, no, we don't do that. And then you just, you lose, you lose the audience. Um, and so for me here, uh, uh, Mark talks about balls in the air, but I also remember during Battlestar, the writers, Mark and David and, and Bradley Thompson, would tell me that um, 
No, the whole thing is just throw an obstacle in front of somebody. It's like, why do you screw with the chief so much? Why do you do this to me? And I said, well, you get going along and it's like, that's not interesting. You got to go wham and do something to him, bonk him on the head. So people who are having substance abuse issues get bonked on the head all the time. Yeah. And uh, you have to be authentic and, and real uh, for people who have gone through it, are going through it, or know someone who's going through it. Then they can go, yeah, no, that's right. That's an, that's a true portrayal. and. Uh, it's a more captivating. It's hard. It's hard to watch. It's hard to read. Yeah. But um, that I think is the whole point of storytelling. Is yeah, I think to, I think the true life real. aspect of it too is is yeah. important. You know, those small communities up there, they do have a huge problem with alcoholism and drugs, and um, and you know we wanted to uh, not shy away from that, as Aaron said. We wanted to to get into it, and you know, fentanyl is. Um, a horrific plague now, uh, yeah. and uh, uh, so uh, we didn't want to shy away from that either. Either, and you know, I think every, even if you don't have personal experience, I think we all have personal experience with friends who have had addiction issues and have gone to a very bad place. And so it's, uh, uh, you know, it's not difficult to put yourself in that head sometimes. I mean, as you're a writer, you're just trying to imagine what it's like to do that. And obviously you don't need to be a fentanyl addict to know how awful that could be. Um, but uh, um, we, uh, we really wanted to try to capture what, what, what that world can do to a small community, what those drugs and that illegal booze and all that stuff can do to it and the violence that the, the gangsters bring to the town. Yeah. That's a, that generational element, you know, her mom couldn't kind of cope with the, the family's destiny, so kind of enter her grandma, the the shaman. Um, I think everyone wants their grandma to be this lady. I mean, I certainly do. Uh, <laughs> so kind of talk to me about developing her as a character and kind of what you wanted to put in her. <laughs> Is your grandma like that? No, no, okay. no, not at all. I just, I love the idea of the give no shits woman. Yeah. Just like tough as nails. Uh, she looks like she's a thousand years old just because she lives where she lives and it is just punishing the, the climate. And um, yeah, the person who speaks, speaks truth to power, no power, whatever, just this is the way it is. So suck it up, buttercup. Yeah, she's a great character. I think Aaron had that one worked out when we just started. So, um, but I loved her and uh, she, uh, you know, yeah, uh, does not take any crap from anybody, and uh, that that's fun. By the way, unlike either one of my grandparents, who are both long gone, but unlike both of them, uh, they were very soft spoken, very nice people. And not that old mother isn't nice. I think old mother is very caring in her own way, uh, but she has sort of a, a gruff, you know, scratchy demeanor that uh, could be a little hard to penetrate sometimes see the, the, the caring that she has deep down inside. She obviously cares for Syl more than anything. And uh, so, you know, that love will never go away. And uh, no matter what happens, it'll never go away. Yeah, I mean, Syl hits a, uh, a sweet spot in terms of age. Um, me staring down 50 this year, uh, and all three of us have kind of East, reached that age, I think, where we do more reflection than we do when we're younger. You know, not to say we're too old, you know, but you reach a point where you see through a different lens, you know, the, the life you, in some ways, different paths, you know, it could have been. It doesn't seem like she's hit that point yet. You know, I'm just starting to script comics myself, you know, shy of 50. It's an interesting experience. I often find myself wanting to write for a younger audience. So how have you, you know, Mark in terms of writing, Aaron more in terms of, of acting, how have you found your voice changing, you know, as a storyteller over time? Because it's, that general generational element was really, really interesting. How it played off um, the three different generations in this story, specific. So. Well, I, I think for you know, uh, and I, you know, as I near fifty, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you're just kids. Um, no, but I think as you get older and you have more life experiences, it colors how you write. So yeah. when I was younger. Uh, you know, I, I think I wrote some stuff I'm proud of, but, you know, as you get older, your your tone matures, and I think your just worldview can mature a little bit. Uh, 
uh, you know, I started writing comics, you know, 38 years ago or something like that. So a long time ago. And, uh, you know, uh, I think there are things I would change in those books. There's things I would never touch. So, you know, you just mature a bit. Um, I, I think the only other thing I've learned over time is sort of the, the, uh, the ability to sort of just launch and go, you know, just sort of, you know, uh, uh, to have, have confidence in what you're putting down, which you don't always have when you're starting. You're very concerned, like, oh, will the editor like this or will there be a problem? And I think as you get along a little bit, you go like, well, no, I don't, I'm not going to worry about that as much. I'm going to worry about telling the best story I can in a way that pleases me because that's the only thing I can do. And, you know, and then hope other people like it. But it has to start with pleasing me, pleasing Aaron on Borealis. And, and you know, that we when we team up together, how do we how do we combine those talents to, to make the best story possible? Um, and I've collaborated a lot, too, with other people over the years on, you know, movie screenplays and on television teleplays. And um, it could be a good experience. It can be a bad experience. But there and it's been a great experience. I, in terms of acting, for me, I, yeah, Mark kind of nailed it. But it's the as you mature, and as you've done it so often and so many times, it's just sort of, I don't be so precious about it. Don't be so oh, oh the world, the world. Like the, I'm not an actor <laughs> actor at all. Uh, I don't sit at the coffee shop and be bemoan life. And so for me, it's just you know, show up, do the work, do, do the work, but you know, we're not, we're getting shot with a camera here. You know, there's, there's not actual shooting, shooting happening. Uh, we're not, you know, saving lives or curing whatever it's, uh, it's important because it, it, uh, brings uh, entertainment and escape for people. Um, but also it is, you know, it's a pretty good gig. If uh, I'm on set, you know, uh, and you're treated like a demigod for, you know, however long you're there. So, yeah, it's um, be a part of the collaboration. Don't be the one standing to the side watching all the worker bees get ready for you, which is just so pretentious and stupid. Um, yeah, for me, I, it's, it's, I still don't know how I do what I do. I've never figured it out. I just... People say, "Would well, you know? Give me some acting advice." I say, "Say your lines as simply as you can. That's that's it." And uh, so, yeah. It, and as I get older, I I just say them more simply, and I whisper <laughs> sometimes. You drive the sound guys nuts. <laughs> Thankfully, I've never done sound. I've done everything else um, in what seems like a different life, but never a sound guy. Never wanted to. That sound just sounds. I couldn't put my arms above my head and hold a boom mic for five minutes like that. I would just. I don't understand how they do it. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No desire. So how did Cliff get recruited to the artwork? Which I, I gotta say fits so well. There's like uh these notes of Frank Miller, especially kind of in the the blockier shadow detail, but it, it's not heavy. You know, the line work doesn't come off with 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 that kind of weight to it. You know, it, it still needs to move a lot as a character because the pace is 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 frantic, plus the whole thing manages to feel you know, somewhat environmentally urban, despite these remote surroundings. You know, when when I first was looking at the general synopsis of this, I was like, okay, remote Alaska. So I had this vision in my head of what I was going to get. This is not that. You know, it, it felt very urban in ways. So, how did Cliff kind of come in, and how did how did your script direct him to to kind of portray some of? Cliff has drawn, I think, my last four or five books. Before this one, I was doing books with uh, Aftershock. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first script I sent to Cliff years ago now, um, I started getting the art back. And this is the first time I'd done a comic. And, and you know, uh, my buddy Joe Pruitt was teaching me how to take, like, because I would just write it like a script like a TV script. And he'd say, no, then you got to break it up into panels. And stuff. Uh, I would send it to Cliff, hoping that he would get what I was trying to say. And he would send art back. And it was exactly what I had in my mind. It freaked me out. Um, so, and this went on book after book after book. He'd write, I, he'd go, you got any notes? I go, um, well, put the railing on the stairs on the other side. Cause that's what it was when I was a kid. 
He was, he was drawing my child, one of my childhood homes, and he would get it exactly right. So I'm either a really great writer and descriptor, which is not the case, uh, or he's just inside my head, which I think is probably more accurate, even though he's in Brazil and I'm in Canada. So I'm not sure. So anyways, um, when it came to this, Mark said, Do you, have you thought about artists? And I said, I got this guy. I love this guy. He's so good and he's fast. And so Mark looked at some of those books and said, yeah, he'd be great. Let's see if uh, Dark Horse will take him on. And Dark Horse knew him and said, yeah, sure. And I think between him and Guy Major, they've just absolutely crushed it. I think the art is great and Guy's coloring is extraordinary. Yeah. Um, working on you know developing my own coloring skills, I got to say, it, it was impressive. And you know, as a former lighting designer, handling the lighting in these panel, panels was had to be really, really challenging because you have the mix of these darker, snowy landscapes and then creating the, the sleaze, um, for lack of a better adjective, inherent to kind of what's happening in this small town. Um, because it, you can't just portray... It, it, there's, there's, I keep coming back to walking tall. I don't know why I keep coming. Back. But there's like this walking tall sort of vibe that's going on with it. Um, but yeah, Guy did a fantastic job with, with yeah. coloring the book. But he, he brought, we, we really wanted that cinematic feel too. So a very film noirish almost feel, even though it's color. And uh, uh, Guy really, really does that well. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and yet when the, the colors explode, like when the Borealis or when there's a supernatural event, it, it almost resonates more because the rest of the color has been so, uh, you know, it's not dark. It's just nourish. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of the, uh, you know, you're living in the dark a lot up there in Alaska, you know, up at far north. And so, you know, it's a lot of very muted uh, light, lighting structures, lighting systems. And uh, I just thought he did a fantastic job. And uh, just to echo Aaron, I thought Cliff did a fantastic job. He's, he is uh, everything you want from a comic book artist. He's, he's incredibly talented. He's fast. He uh, does more than you expect, which is something I, I love is, you know, to surprise me, you know. And so, you know, when he did some of the effects that we were asking for, and of course, in your mind, you imagine, you know, hey, these guys are getting attacked by a supernatural force. You can imagine it. This guy has to realize it. He did a fantastic job. So um, I think we got, uh, you know, lucky with, with Lyft. Um, and again, I've done a lot of comics. You can be unlucky. <laughs> so we were we were lucky with Cliff. I've been luckier yeah. more than unlucky. But and Cliff is so kind. He's yeah. such a nice man, and and that it makes it all the better. And he's super excited to do more. He's like, I love drawing this book of this series. Let's do more. Can I come on? Can I be part of more? It's like, buddy, you'll draw everything I ever write if I have my <laughs> say. <clears throat> yeah, he's really, really good. We're yeah, when you have you. okay. Yeah, when you have that kind of uh, synthesis with with somebody, you don't ever want to let them go. I, no. I've interviewed many people, and that that are like, no, I'm I don't ever want to work with anybody else. No, no offense to other artists, like they are great, but you know, when you have that person who pulls it out of your head, that's kind of a special, absolutely type of relationship. Yeah, for sure. Well, this was kind of being solicited as a supernatural thriller, which it is. Um, but kind of as I've alluded to it, it feels hard boiled um, to me. So, what does it look like for both of you, kind of in terms of a writing process together you know, when you're when you're scripting? Are you just we bouncing ideas of, kind of <laughs> off each other? Or? Yeah, we spent a lot of time bouncing ideas off each other, and we, you know, long sheets of notes and texts and you know stuff like that, and uh, and then uh, you know started started scripting. We'd bounce the script back and forth, and there you go. I mean, it's uh, these processes can be hard and they can be easy, and this was easy. So you know, we just bounced stuff back and forth a lot. I mean, a lot before we went to the first. There were there were a lot of I think, um, I don't want to say blind alleys, because a lot of stuff you come up with, you can do in other episodes, in, in future stories. But, um, you know, we we are very happy to have 66 pages. We probably could have had 166 yeah. uh, to tell the story. So, uh, 
you know, we, we, by, by definition, we had to sort of really craft it down and eliminate some of the storylines that we had thought about, but, you know, we'll save for future stories, God willing, we can do them. And, um, so that's, uh, but yeah, collaboration, we just exchange stuff left and right. It's how I've collaborated with everybody basically is you bounce ideas back and forth and, um, you know, you, you can be very rigid about it because I've been on things where you like just split the script in half and um, you never want to be on the south side of that one because everything can change on the top and then you're rewriting your whole script. Uh, but uh, yeah, I thought our way worked great. I don't know what Aaron thinks, but I, I thought so. Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent. That's exactly what it is. I will send we'll get to a thing where there's somebody's at a crossroads and I go, I will just say. Okay, well, how about she does this, or she does this, or she does this, or she does this, and he'll go, "Oh, I love the third one. Let's go with the third one." Okay, so we just do that, and we just, yeah, we just send it back and forth, and or he'll text me and he'll say, "That scene in the bordello, you want me to tackle that, and you can work on the hospital thing." I say, "Sure, absolutely." So he'll send the scene for the bordello. I go, "Ah, that's awesome." And I say, Here's my hospital stuff. Okay, and then a little bit of tweaks, and then we find a way to marry them so they're page to page and. That's it. Yeah, we just kind of bomb through it. It's um, yeah. It's I mean, this it's much better than writing it by myself. That's for sure. My other I books are like I needed. Yeah, 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 I need I need a mark. So I've got Cliff. I've got Mark. I've got Guy. I'm sorted. Done. Yeah. So a basically, one of those. Native Alaskan <coughs> gangster. Find your fate is is your writing pro- process almost. Like, yes. So maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's a choose your own adventure as we go. So we're exactly. making it up as we go. Yeah. Well, you know, three issues feels like a teaser. Um, so there's kind of so many untapped legends that really for the most part, Western readers haven't been exposed to outside of like the Wendango, which gets dropped all over the map. Um, but there are lots of body snatchers up north, um, lots of different um mythologies to explore. You've kind of teased us. Um, are you you're planning on working on more than three issues with this? God willing. Oh yeah, no, yeah. If uh, Dark Horse says uh, series two, I've got four or five books in mind for that one, and then on and on and on. My idea for this is every series is like ten episodes of a season, and then the next and the next and the next. So if we could go like. You turn this into a TV show and it goes three or four or five years, that would be sort of the ideal thing for me. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think, uh, you know, and each, by the way, we want to make it, I think I made it clear that uh, the first series um, does sort of have a resolution of sorts. Um, and then we sort of tease up something else. So um, we, uh, I always like the idea too, is sort of what Aaron said of like the 10 episode idea is that you kind of reach some resolution but there's so much still hanging out there you can play with. And again, it's balls in the air. You know, we've got so many things we can play with. Uh, and uh, we've teased a little bit in the first two issues. We hit on it harder in the third issue. You'll see a new character that uh, pops up that uh, would be, you know, sort of central to uh, what a uh, second series might be. Um, and uh, But yeah, right now it's uh, the ball is in Dark Horse's core. We want to see what they think. And uh, book's still coming out, and there'll be a hardcover in June. Okay. Uh, and uh, we'll, or June or July, I think. Right and, before uh, Comic-Con, right before San yeah, Diego Comic-Con, yeah. the hardcover comes out. Yep. So, uh, you know, it's there's there's plans to keep this alive for a while, and then uh, um, our fingers are crossed that they'll want to do another one. So we're going to see you, Mark, back in San Diego in June is what I'm hearing, signing at Dark Horse. Find me down, baby. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stay my way. <laughs> yeah. Well, what else you guys got cooking? Aaron, you're up first. Uh, whatever Mark and I want to write next. Um, we have other ideas other than Borealis that uh, I'm pretty excited about. And I'm actually starting a new TV show uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, oh, wow. That's okay. It's going to take, uh, I can't talk about it yet. Yeah, I'm used to that. I'm very excited about it because it's uh, I'm finally back on what I feel like is my show, something I could take ownership of, something I I'm not just parachuting in and doing a guest star or doing a short arc. Like I'm I'm properly towards the top of the call sheet, so um, that feels really good, and I'm really excited about it for and it's for a big network down south, 
And uh, we're filming in Canada, and Canada is playing as Canada, which I found very interesting, but very exciting as well. So um, hopefully I'll be able to uh, talk to the world about it uh, as soon as they give me the uh, go-ahead. I haven't been announced yet, so that's the only reason. Mark, what about you? Uh, you know, more Borealis would be fun. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I had a couple of projects I was working on, uh, last year that, uh, uh, we're still putzing around, but, uh, I'm, uh, uh, enjoying, uh, sort of, uh, moving back into comics to some extent. And so, you know, whether it's Borealis or, uh, another thing Aaron and I come up with, or who knows what, I, I keep all my options open. I never say never. I never say never to more TV or, or movies either. But um, at this point, uh, um, comics were always my first sort of love. And uh, it's funny to be coming full circle back to those. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I love comics in ways that as much as I love television and, and movies. And, you know, I find them a very different sort of form. Uh, but uh, uh, exciting and uh, uh, and it's great to work with somebody like Cliff and with Aaron and the uh, great collaborators and and Dark Horse for that matter who I've worked with now for 38 years as well. So um, you know they're they're uh, very supportive of, of us and of the book and um, you know let's I, I would love to do more of those. So hopefully we'll get more. Uh, Borealis issue one is in the wild right now and issue two should be out. Next week, the the seventeenth. That correct? I believe so. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hit your local comic shop and snag yourself a copy of this. I I really really enjoyed it. I have no clue how you're going to wrap it up in just the the three issues. Um, but I can I can firmly say I want more of that. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Well, Mark and Aaron, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate you coming on the podcast and chatting a little bit about Borealis. Thanks Great. for having us. Thanks. Sure. Thank you very much. This is Byron O'Neill. And on behalf of all of us at Comic Book Yeti, thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next time. This is Byron O'Neill, one of your hosts of the Cryptid Creator Corner, brought to you by Comic Book Yeti. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Please rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. It lets us know how we're doing, and more importantly, how we can improve. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner, maybe you would enjoy our sister podcast, Into the Comics Cave. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.